watch Symposium I'm Austin. All right, so paid video for rat skunk. All right, so before I get started, pause this video, take a look at the link in the description, click on that, and that'll take you to rat skunk's writing, which is what this video is about. So have a look at that. All right, so he wrote to me, Mr. Daniels, I would enjoy a video of your comments, thoughts, criticism, good, bad, or ugly of the article found at ratskunk.com forward slash Rolex. The article is ostensibly an overview of the Mondani Rolex Submariner book sprinkled with my comments about the Submariner, though more or less it may be a stream of unconsciousness on my part. Please keep my real identity anonymous. Thank you. You got it, Ratskunk. All right, so have you taken a look at that article? I highly recommend it. It's very interesting. What are my overall impressions? Well, it's as if a watch aficionado has cracked open his skull and let pour forth his eloquent ruminations of Rolex and the Submariner model. It's uh, somewhat disjointed, but that adds an element of interest because each section is a thought-provoking idea uh, gone into detail that he talks about. And he seems to approach his writing the way I approach my videos. I start with an interesting idea and I make a video about it, and he does the same. And also interesting was that you get an idea about what kind of person he is. And, you know, your stereotypical modern Rolex wear is your brash businessman who has the two-tone date just and he loves this F-off factor and what it projects, and it projects success and money. It's a symbol of uh, capitalism and corporate greed, and it's a, it's a piece of jewelry, and he's clearly not that guy. He's not that Rolex wanker, and I thought it was interesting because, as we will see, he is much more interested in vintage pieces and pre-ceramic pieces. And so, you know, I think there's a connection between that type of watch aficionado and w ones that go for the more modern pieces. And he's clearly educated. He's a good writer. He has a wide vocabulary. And it's clear that he's, he's thoughtful and contemplative and has the heart of an artist. And throughout his writing, he has literary quotes interspersed, and he makes mention of Shakespeare, and he's a fan of the arts, particularly Jackson Pollock. And so he is the kind of guy that I'm not surprised is into vintage pieces and appreciates uh, appreciates Rolex for, uh, for the bygone era of the tool watch of which they were, and unfortunately or fortunately are no longer. Um, now, he talks about getting his Mondani books and, and why. He, he writes, I bought the book to tutor myself on two vintage Submariner models I am keen on acquiring in the next two to three years, namely a 5513, that's a no date sub, and a 1680, which is a date sub. That's the very first date sub. And once I make my notes and such, then I will part with the books. All right, so he has decided to uh, foray into the vintage market, and he's armed himself with the Mondani books. Now, I've never actually seen a Mondani book, but from what I understand, they're very detailed and they're sort of the Bible of these Rolex models. And the Submariner book is a two volume set. And if you are looking to deal in vintage pieces or get into buying vintage pieces, it could be a good idea to pick up these books. They're expensive though, over 400 euros. So a little out of my price range. Um, at the moment, I'm reading uh, The Watch Book Rolex by Bruner, and that's a little bit more moderately priced at under 100 euros. I'm thoroughly enjoying that. Um, but he's he's looking to get a couple of models and educating himself. And, and a lot of what this article is um, are notes uh, from, from his studies. He writes, the Rolex Mariner wants the paragon of a tool circumscribed by the austerity of the sea, now dolefully promoted, though forsooth, stripped of rank to jewelry. Once the Submariner was, was worn while performing underwater tasks on offshore oil rigs in the North Sea, whereas now people brood over scuffing the clasp of their watch on the Formica workstation of their office cubicle. So indeed, the identity of these watches as two watches have shifted 
to jewel, pieces of jewelry, and um, whereas they used to be tool watches meant to dive down to the deep depths of the ocean, now they're, they're pieces of jewelry that uh, do little more than desk diving. It is lamentable that the identity of the oyster has changed that much, um, but I think it's the product of innovation and perhaps the quartz crisis. And, you know, when it comes down to it, there are less expensive, stronger, better to watch options than something like this. GMT 8 serial, all black bezel on a Jubilee. All right, but um, there was a time, uh, a nostalgic past that I think he looks back to, and, and I do as well, when Rolex were to watches and they were the best thing going. And the quartz crisis very well may have been the first nail in the coffin to that. He goes on to talk about the design aesthetics and he writes, is changelessness across a span that exceeds my time on earth Yes, there are the Hulks, Kermits, Bluesies, but overall the Submariner has shown a restraint all but forsaken in modern horology. Consider the Omega Seamaster with a fecundity only topped by the fruitfulness of the Omega Speedmaster, the ad nauseum parade of Omega Speedmaster limited editions, anniversaries, reissues, etc. That's very interesting, and, and there is a design aesthetic that has been maintained throughout many of these models, the Explorer, the GMT, the Submariner models. I mean, you put a 1953 sub next to a, a modern Serachrome sub and you can still see the design aesthetics there. And Rolex has, in that sense, really stayed true uh, to those models, those iconic models, and in my opinion, have done right by them. And, you know, you look at Rolex, which he mentions, not Rolex, I'm sorry, you look at Omega, which he mentions, and they uh, have a more exploitative approach. And in the end, I think it damages what is is the central aesthetic of the Speedmaster or the Seamaster. And it's all for a buck. Uh, Rolex, of course, is after something a little bit different. Uh, I think they're more after protecting the brand versus uh, the short-term gains uh, financially of um, exploitive design practices. And so for that reason, maybe, maybe they're just trying to protect the brand, but what that means is, is protecting uh, the integrity of the design aesthetics of these watches. And you got to respect them for that. And I do appreciate Rolex for that. And you might not like the way they've gone with the Cerachrome, um, We'll get into that in a minute, but they have certainly um, been true to the original design aesthetics uh, of these two watches. The next paragraph I think is my favorite. I really identify with, with this sentiment. He writes, I confess that I find the modern Rolex Submariner an inelegant, almost clumsy iteration of the Submariner as compared to vintage models and pre-ceramic models. Ironically, at least to me, as the Rolex Submariner has degenerated into more or less luxury jewelry, the Submariner has become brutalist looking, while the vintage tool watches look more debonair every day. Absolutely. I mean, this is what I've been saying all along, right? Um, it's almost like I wrote that. Uh, it's not mine, but um, but I, I it's well put, and I agree 100%. And it's very interesting how... Um, Indeed, as it has become jewelry, at the same time, it's become more brutalist with that thick case and those fat lugs and the thick hands and the maxi dial and the shiny bezel with the greater width. And it certainly has lost something. I mean, a lot of people like the new aesthetic, um, but there is a beauty of the pre-ceramic, I think, that that um, is undeniable. And when it comes down to it, I know it's 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 a matter of opinion, uh, but but I agree wholeheartedly with what he says there. And um, and it's interesting that that uh, a reflective person who does seem to have the heart of an artist uh, would feel that way. 
And I think that says something perhaps objectively about the beauty of these pre-ceramics. I'll end with this. He talks about the name Submariner, and I think this is particularly interesting. I've thought about this myself. He starts with a quote from Shakespeare. What's in a name? That which we call a rose by any other name would smell as sweet. He writes, Juliet may have felt that way about Romeo, but is it true for the Rolex Submariner? Would the Submariner smell as sweet today if the original name was Sea Wolf, Lion Shark, Captain Cook, Sea Slug, Hydro Conquest, Snorkel, Frogman, Sea Strong, Trident, Super Ocean, Seahawk, Aquascape, Ocean Avenger, Amphibia, or Scuba Dragon? Submariner seems a peerless name for a dive watch, but did the name make the watch or did the watch make the name? And he never gives us an answer, but he leaves it to us to ponder it. And it's thought provoking indeed. And I don't know the answer to that, but I will say that Submariner is perfect. It's a, it's, it's a perfect name and, and it's, it's, it gives you a window into the identity of the watch as a, as a, as a seagoing watch to be worn in water. It has an air of adventure, but it's not overly macho, like the sea wolf or the lion shark or something as such. Now, on a side note, I always think that TGV really missed the mark with, with the naming of his watch. I think he should have named it the lionfish. The lionfish is a real fish. It uh, looks like a lion and, and has spines that sting, and it's a beautiful fish. And... Uh, and I think that would have been a better better choice, but he goes for the um, overly macho lion shark um, as if to compensate for something. And it, my favorite, I think, is the Explorer. I think that's a fantastic name. The Submariner is probably my second favorite, a close second. I think the GMT Master is a great name. Um, I don't know, what are your favorites? Are there any that you dislike? I'd have to say one of my, my least favorite uh, names is the Sky Dweller. Okay, because to dwell means to sort of, it's got that nuance of not moving, but uh, being somewhat passive and static. And uh, t for somebody flying through the air at great speeds, dwelling, I don't know, sky dwellers just doesn't do it for me. Whereas sea dweller sort of makes sense because to be in those, those saturation chambers uh, for saturation diving, you, are, you really are dwelling deep down into the sea. But uh, yeah. Anyway, um, I'll let you guys debate that. Uh, would a Submariner be a Submariner without being called a Submariner? Well, oh, it's a hard one. Um, I guess we'll just leave it that it's a near perfect name. What happened? Did he get his uh, vintage watches? Well, in the end he writes, I do not have the fortitude to enter the rat trap strewn rabbit warren of vintage Rolex. And neither do I. Um, if you're John Mayer and you can afford to make a few mistakes, so be it, but uh, I can't. And so for that reason, I like the turn of the millennium models. I think these Neo vintage models offer a usability, um, yet the vintage aesthetic that, that, uh, that I love and that this gentleman seems to appreciate as well. Rat Skunk, thanks for your question. Thanks for the link to your your writing. I thoroughly enjoyed it. And uh, if you write more, uh, send me another link to it. I'd love to read it. Um, do you want a video for yourself? Link in the description to my PayPal account. Send me 10 bucks. Put the question in the description to the PayPal payment or uh, send me an email. Link in the description to my email address and I'll make a video for you. Take care. Thanks for watching. See you next time.